Hi, welcome to Orozco's lectures. I am Jose Orozco, and these are my lectures. This lecture is a Calculus 1 lecture. I hope you enjoy it. This is chapter 1, which is a pre-calc review. All right, so the grand majority of this chapter you should already know coming into this course. Um, so this chapter will just be brief in comparison to the others. So 1.1. 1.1 is called graphs and models. All right. <clears throat> so we'll start with graphs of an equation and two variables. Graphs of equations and two variables. All right. And first, we're going to consider linear equations. All right. So let's look at linear equations. In general, they are of the form ax plus by is equal to c. All right. Um, that is the standard form, but they can also come in slope-intercept form. Y equals mx plus b. All right. We also have quadratic equations. And they are of the form y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. Or you can write them as y is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. All right, that would be the vertex form of a parabola. But first, let's let's do a quick example of each. All right, so for the linear equations, we can have things like 2x plus y is equal to 7. All right, and to figure out what kind of values we get from there, all right, we would say things like, well, let's, let's make a table. All right, we can make an xy table and come up with different values for x to figure out what the values for y would be, all right? So if I plug in, for example, 0 for x, I end up with y is equal to 7. If I plug in 1, I end up with y is equal to 5. If I plug in 2, I end up with y is equal to 3. Similarly, if I plug in negative 1, I end up with um, y is equal to 9. If I plug in negative 2, I end up with y is equal to 11, so on and so forth. All right, now, this, how would this look? If you think about the x and y plane, right, where the x is the horizontal plane, excuse me, the x is the horizontal axis, and the y is the, is the vertical axis, and we were to plot all these points, negative 2, 11, negative 1, 9, uh, 0, 7, so on and so forth, 1, 5, 2, 3, right? So in here, we would just connect all of these dots like so and say that is the graph of our equation, right? And in general, the blue part, well, the, that line in blue, that is the actual graph, all right? The x and y axis are just the coordinate planes. The graph is the actual drawing that our equation would make. Similarly, for a quadratic equation, we could have something like y is equal to x squared minus 3, right? And in there, we could also create an xy table for different values. And I'll plug in the same things, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. If I start with 0, plug in 0 minus 3, that's negative 3. Plug in 1, I end up with negative 2. Plug in 2, I end up with 1. Similarly, when I plug in negative 1, I end up with similar values as before, right? And in here, if again, we look at our xy plane, well, what is this? 0, negative 3, uh, 1, negative 2, 2, 1, so on and so forth, right? And then we would just connect these dots. And there is our quadratic equation, um, a quadratic function. So in here, this is a parabola, right? 
parabolas can be facing upwards or downwards. That very much depends on our leading coefficient. Now, some other stuff that we should recall. Intercepts. There's two kinds of intercepts. There's the x-intercept, and then there's the y-intercept. The x-intercept is when x is equal to 0. And in general, this would give us a form of, well, x is mu. I messed that up. The x-intercept is when y is equal to 0. There we go. When y is equal to 0, and in general, these are the form of a comma 0. The y-intercept is when x is equal to 0. In general, this would be the form of 0 comma b. All right. <clears throat> now, what does this look like on the graph? Well, let's look at an xy plane. Right. Our x, y plane. And let's say that we had a function that looked like this. All right. So in here, in yellow, these are all x-intercepts. The x-intercepts are in yellow. And in red, we've got our y-intercept. I will make a note here. All right. And in general, so here's our note. A function can have infinitely many um, x-intercepts, but no more than one y-intercept. All right. So a function could have infinitely many x-intercepts, but at maximum, it would have one y-intercept. So now, um, we'll talk more about functions later on. In the meantime, let's, right now what we're doing is focusing on just general aspects of a graph. So let's talk about symmetry of a graph. So symmetry of a graph. And there's really three types of symmetries that we're going to be concerned with here. There's symmetry about the y-axis. So this is y-axis symmetry. Symmetry about the x-axis. And symmetry about the origin. All right. So in here, let's say in the y-axis symmetry, Let's say that we have this drawing. All right. So if we had that drawing, symmetry about the y-axis would mean that we would also have this. Right. Um, for the x-axis symmetry, let's say that we again had the same drawing. Um, and the symmetry there would make it look like this. Right. And then for the origin, symmetry about the origin, let's say that we have this. Right. Then symmetry about the origin would be as follows. So those are the three types of symmetries. All right. Now there are some of these that do come up a lot. For example, y-axis symmetry. We have things like y equals x squared. All right. Y equals x squared is symmetric about the y-axis. All right. So I have something that looks different for you. So that's y equals x squared. We can have things like x equals y squared. All right, and x equals y squared would be symmetric about the x-axis. This would not be a function, however. All right. Um, in general, things that have symmetry about 
the x-axis are not usually functions. Um, so symmetry about the origin, we could talk about something like y equals x cubed. All right. Symmetry about the origin is also called rotational symmetry. All right. Um, there are also some trig functions that have these kinds of symmetries. For example, y equals cosine of x. That is symmetric about the y-axis. And it looks as follows. So, repeating forever and ever, right? And similarly, we have things that are symmetric about the y-axis. So sticking with trig, I could say something like y equals sine of x. And sine of x looks as follows. It is also, so it is symmetric about the origin, right? And again, it, another way of saying symmetry about the origin is that it has rotational symmetry. There are no functions that are <coughs> symmetric about the y-axis. Let me, let me rephrase that. There are no functions that are symmetric about the x-axis. All right. Um, we can talk about why that would be later, but in general, is it fails the vertical line test. All right. So now, that is really the end of 1.1. So let's talk about 1.2. 1.2 is called linear models and rates of change. All right. So here we go. First, let's talk about the slope of a line. In general, the slope of a line, we write it with the symbol n. And you may not, may not recall that it is given by the change in y over the change in x, all right? That's delta y over delta x. In general, we like to think of this as uh, y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1, all right? Think of this as rise over run where the rise is the vertical change and the run is a horizontal change all right <clears throat> in here in this fraction we have to make sure that x of 2 is not equal to x of 1 why would that be well think about it if they were the same then we would have a fraction over 0 and that would make it undefined we will discuss that scenario in a second now let's look at what slopes look like overall on a graph. So let me draw a couple of xy planes here. Uh, this one got a little bit bigger. So we're going to look at four different scenarios for lines. All right. We could have something that looks like that, or like that, or like so, or like that. All right. So now in here. In this first scenario, we have our slope being positive. Our slope is greater than zero. Notice that from left to right, it looks like the line is going up. All right, so if from left to right, the line is going up, it has a positive slope. Similarly, if from left to right, it's going down, it's got a negative slope. All right. If we have a horizontal line, all right, in the scenario we have horizontal lines, the slope is zero. And in the scenario where we have a vertical line, the slope is undefined. And again, think about it. If we had any given two points on here, they would have the same x value. So having the same x value would mean that in our formula, up here, the x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that would be 0. So we would have a fraction over 0, which again would make the fraction undefined, which is why we would say that the slope is undefined. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about, since we're talking about lines and slopes, let's talk about the equation of a line, all right? And first, we're going to talk about the point-slope form. All 
and the point slope form is as follows. So given the point x sub 1 comma y sub 1 and slope m, all right, we have this formula y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times x minus x sub 1. That is the point slope formula of a linear equation. And notice here that this point slope formula is very cleverly named. All right. And that's a that's very true in general of mathematics. We like to name things very cleverly. What do I mean here? If you look at here, I'm saying that it's if, if, if I'm given a point and a slope, then I use the point slope formula. So it's already given in the name that we're gonna be working with a point and a slope point slope all right so now let's uh let's see a scenario where we use this so we have find the equation of a line of a line with slope one third passing through the point negative 3 comma 4 all right so let's see what happens there so in general so we're looking for the equation of a line right so i'm going to i'm going to see what's given to me it's given given a slope and a point a point and a slope so there we go point slope formula and what was the point slope formula it was y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times x minus x sub 1. What we're going to say now is, well, I'm given the point, I'm given the slope, so all I need to do with this point slope formula is replace everything that I'm given. So I have y minus, my y, val my y value is 4. m, m was 1 third, and my x sub 1, my x value was negative 3. All right, so I want to, before I keep going here, I want to mention something. Notice that the very first thing I did here to, to start this problem was I wrote down the formula that I needed. That is very good practice in general, all right? I highly recommend that you get into the practice of writing down the formula that you need in the problem. It helps you remember the formula if you're writing it down every single time. The other thing that I did here, the values that I'm plugging in, I put them in parentheses, all right? And I put them in parentheses so that I know that, like, well, there might be some other things that are being done to them. Now, in the case of the first parentheses, the one I put here with the 4, well, those parentheses aren't doing anything. But in the second parentheses here, the one I put around the negative 3, well, I have a minus negative 3, which turns into a positive 3. All right? In general, parentheses are your friends. All right? Make sure that you use parentheses when you're plugging stuff in. It'll help you. Um, with arithmetic overall. So now, let's distribute that one third. One third times x is one third x. One third times three is one. Moving the four over means plus four. And I have, finally, as my answer is y is equal to one third x plus five, where all I did there was combine like terms. And there you go. We found the equation of our line. Notice now that the form at the very end there it's not the form that I started with. This is in the point slope, excuse me, in the slope intercept form. So this is slope intercept form. And very briefly, let's, let's recall what the slope intercept form is. Slope intercept form. And y is equal to mx plus b, where m is the slope, and the point 0, b is the y-intercept. 
So there we go again, be super clever with the name, way we name things. All right, we, we, we had the slope intercept form where we're given a slope and an intercept. So we call it the slope intercept form. Cool, now <clears throat> let's, uh, let's sketch some stuff. Let's sketch uh, another equation here, all right? So let's say, so sketch the following and I've got 3y plus x minus 6 is equal to 0 all right so the very first thing I'm gonna do here is I I don't want to work with it this way we like we like to have y equals so the very first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna solve for y so moving the x and the 6 over I end up with 3y is equal to negative x plus 6 divided by 3 y is equal to negative 1 third x plus 2 all right now if I want to go ahead and sketch this well we know that it is going to be a line right this is the equation of, this is a linear equation so because it's going to be a line well we know that we only really need two points to determine a line as soon as you've got two points you know what the line looks like so let's figure out some two points here and the two points I'm going to work with are the intercepts so we have the x intercept where y is equal to 0 and the y-intercept where x is equal to 0. In general, so for the y-intercept is the easiest. You plug in 0, negative 1 third times 0 is 0. Add 2 to that, so we have the point y equals 2. So the coordinate is 0, 2. When I do the x-intercept here, well, plug in y is equal to 0, so I have 0 is equal to negative 1 third x plus 2. Move everything over, so put the variables on one side and the non-variables on the other side. So I have one third x equals two, therefore x is equal to six and multiplying both sides by three. So at that point, I know that when x is six, y is zero. So I get my coordinate. And now if I'm gonna go ahead and sketch this, right? Well, what do we have? We have the point six zero, let's say that's all the way up here, and the point zero two, let's say that's there. And those are just two points, so now I can determine a line. And that was close enough. Let's just start there. There we go. Now it looks like I didn't mess up. Love it. Now that is the sketch of our that is the graph of our equation. Let's uh, let's move on. A little bit more about slopes. All right. So, given two lines, we can figure out whether they are parallel or perpendicular. So let's look at parallel and perpendicular lines. All right. So, in here. Parallel lines. Well, two lines are parallel if their slopes are equal to each other. All right. So I would say here, slopes are the same. And we normally use this symbol to mean parallel, just two vertical lines. All right. And now for perpendicular, the slopes. So the slope of one is the negative reciprocal of the other one. So slopes are negative reciprocals of each other. And we use this symbol. It looks like an upside down capital T. All right. Really what that's showing is two right angles. But anyway. So that is parallel perpendicular. Here's the general idea between parallel and perpendicular lines. So we really need to look at is the slopes. Now, let's uh, let's use some some of that. So given that y is equal to negative two fifths x plus three, find the following. And I believe in my example C, probably maybe I don't know. So 
let's find the equation of a line parallel let's, 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 let's rephrase that the equation of a parallel line um, with y-intercept 0, 7 alright so we're looking for a parallel line all right so in here that tells us all we really need to know in in terms of how to start this because it has to be a parallel line to the given equation we already know the slope the slope is negative two-fifths we're given the y-intercept here the y-intercept here tells us that b is equal to seven so now i can go ahead and say well my answer is going to be y equals negative two-fifths x plus seven because all i was given was the slope and the y-intercept specifically the y-intercept so i don't even have to worry about um, using the the point slope formula so that was doing that one let's do another one let's do let D. let's say that we're going to find the equation of a perpendicular line passing through um, let's say it's I don't know 4 3 let's do negative 3 yeah way more exciting so now in here since I know that we're looking for a parallel line excuse me a perpendicular line I know that the slope needs to be the negative reciprocal of the given line. So that's going to tell me right away that my slope is 5 halves, right? Because it's a negative reciprocal. And over here, I'm given a point. So now, in here, essentially, what we're given is a point and a slope. A point and slope. Point and slope. So we're going to use the point slope formula, which was y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times x minus x sub 1. Notice again that the very first thing I did there was write down that formula. Now, let's plug in what we know. y minus y sub 1. What was y sub 1? Negative 3. m was 5 halves. And x sub 1 was positive 4. So now, let's uh, get rid of some parentheses here. This is really saying y plus 3 is equal to if I distribute the 5 halves, I have 5 halves x minus 10, right? The 2 and the 4 reduce becomes just a 2, and 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. So if I finally move the 3 over, that tells me now that y is equal to 5 halves x minus 13. There we go. Now we're done. We put it into slope-intercept form, and we're finished. So that is the end of 1.2 1.3 is functions and their graphs all right so in here what we're really doing is just getting more information from what we were already talking about, and then we're gonna remind each other, we're, we're gonna remind you of what some of these graphs look like. So let's start more very generic here. A relation between two sets x and y. All right, so I have type sets x and y. So a relation is a set of ordered pairs in the form x comma y where x is an element of the set x and y is an element of the set y. All right, and here again, so this symbol 
means it's an element of. And it looks like a C with a line through it. I don't know. But anyway, so that's in general what a relation is. Now, we don't really use relations. We like to talk about functions. So let's talk about functions. So let's have a definition here. A real valued function f Right, a real value function f of a real variable x from set x to y is a relation that assigns. to each number, lowercase x, in set x, exactly one number y in set y. All right, that should have been a capital Y, that's fine. The domain of f is the set x the number y lowercase y is the image of lowercase x under f and is denoted f of x, right? And again, it's pronounced f of x, which is called the value of f at x. The range the range of f is a subset of the set y and consists of all images of numbers in x, in capital X and set x. All right, so I'll read that real quick again and give a quick visual. A real valued function f of a real variable x from set x to set y is a relation that assigns to each number x in set x exactly one number y in set y. The domain of f is the set x. The number y, the lowercase y, is the image of x under f and is denoted f of x, which is called the value of f at x. All right. The range of f is a subset of y and consists of all images of numbers in x. I just mentioned here also that x is called the independent variable. And y is called the dependent variable. All right, now, just a quick idea of what this actually is. Let's say that I have some set X and some set Y, all right? So in here, what we're saying is this set X has a whole bunch of elements, right? Some little element X sub one, some X sub two, so on and so forth, right? A bunch of them. Over here in Y, we have another set. We might have something like Y sub 1, Y sub 2, right, and a whole bunch of other things. But for, but for now, let's just stick to, to these ideas. 
I'll also put over here a y sub 3 to make a point. Let's say that we're going to be going from x to y via the function f. So let's say that x sub 1 goes to y sub 1. So in there, that would make that the image of x sub 1. And now we'll do this in a different color. There we go. And x sub 2, let's say that, that goes to y sub 2. All right. In here, if x sub 1 and x sub 2 are everything that exists in set x, in other words, in the domain, then the range is what I circled here in yellow, right? Just y sub 1 and y sub 2. y sub 3, even though it is in set y, it's not being hit by any set in x, therefore it's not part of the range, all right? Because again, the range is just a subset of y that consists of all the images of numbers in x. So pretty much anything that's hit from x. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's okay. It's okay to have things in the set that we're going to not be hit by anything in the set that we're coming from. What wouldn't be okay is if we have, um, well, maybe I'll give an example of what wouldn't be okay. All right. Um, and you know what? I'll do, I'll modify this example a little bit. This would also still be okay. Let's say that this x of 3 also went to y sub 2. That's still okay for functions. We're allowed to have multiple inputs go to the same output. So this right here is a function. The next thing I'm going to draw here is not going to be a function. So again, I'll start with these values x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, and they'll be going to y sub 1, y sub 2, y sub 3. So in here, this would not be a function. Let's say that I have x sub 1 going to y sub 2 as well as y sub 1. x sub 2 being going to y sub 1 and x sub 3 going to y sub 3. Um, in there, this is not a function. And the reason this is not a function is this part right here. Actually, no, that, that, that part's fine. I meant to circle this part. This part over here, there we go. We've got one element going to multiple elements. All right, we got one element in our domain having multiple images. You cannot have that, all right? That's what fails, um, that's what makes this not a function. The fact that we have one element going to multiple elements. It's okay that multiple elements go to the same element, so the fact that x of one and x of two are both going to y of one, no issue there. The issue again is that x of 1 is going to two elements. All right? So now, evaluating a function. So let's look at this. Now let's say that I have, so given f of x is equal to x squared plus 7, evaluate the following. And let's say that I said something like f of 2, right? And f of 2 means, well, we plug in 2 for x. So I have 2 squared plus 7. 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 7 is 11. Nice. Let's say that I had something like negative 5 f of negative 5. Well, what does that mean? That means plug in negative 5, square it, and add 7. Negative 5 quantity squared is 25 plus 7 is 32. All right, cool. But now let's say that I had something like f of 3a. Well, what do we do there? Well, let's think about this. Let's think about this. And I'm going to do some, some side work over here so that we can think out loud or handwritten thought, I don't know. Anyway, so we can write our thoughts. So if I have something like f of star, we would say, well, what does this really mean? This means star squared plus seven. If I had something like f of happy face, 
that would say happy face squared plus 7. If I had something like f of broccoli, all right, so we would have broccoli squared plus 7, all right. Now, what's my point here? My point here is that whatever that I whatever I had in my in the parentheses here replace the x, right? Anything that was in the parentheses replace the x, just like what we did over here. This two replace that x. This negative five replace that x. So we're gonna do the same exact thing. This three a. We're going to replace the x, so we get 9a squared plus 7. All right, because again, whatever's inside the parentheses replaces the x. Similarly, we can say something like, um, that's supposed to be d, not b. There we go. f of b minus 1. Well, that would say b minus 1 squared plus 7. And we, if, if we expand this, this would give us b squared minus 2b plus 1 plus 7, which would be b squared minus 2b plus 8. All right. And now let's say that we had something like, that was e, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. All right. Now here, <clears throat> this is called the difference quotient, right? Maybe I'll make a note here on the side. This is the difference quotient. Difference quotient. All right. So <clears throat> what does this do? Well, I have f of x plus h minus f of x. Well, f of x plus h, what is that? Well, it's just saying plug in x plus h wherever I have an x. So I'm going to have x plus h squared plus 7 minus, and then I have f of x. That's just x squared plus 7, all of this over h. Now, you may or may not recall this, but from the from pre-calc, the point of these different scorching problems was to get rid of the h in the bottom. So let's expand as much as possible on the numerator. <coughs> And this gives us x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 7. Distribute that negative, minus x squared minus 7, all of this over h. Now, the next thing we do here is combine like terms. The x squared cancels out that negative x squared. The positive 7 cancels out that negative 7. And if you'll note now, the only thing that's left is just stuff with h's. So 2xh plus h squared over h. The only stuff that's left is still has an h. Everything has an h. So what we can do here is, on the numerator, factor out an h, and then we're left with 2x plus h. All of this over h, and in there, the h's cancel each other out, giving us a final answer of 2x plus h. All right. <clears throat> so that is something with the difference quotient. And again, the, the, the real idea behind the difference quotient problem is just to get rid of the H on the bottom. Anyway, so that was E. Let's, uh, let's talk about finding domains. All right, so in here, first we'll talk about the domain of a function. So we're not in D. What are we on? F. All right. So here we go. F. So we're going to be finding a bunch of the domains. So in here, I'm going to say let's let f of x be equal to 1 over x squared minus 4. Right? In general, when you when you're thinking about how to find the domain of a function, what you really should be thinking about is what am I allowed to plug in? Now that's a pretty difficult question because there's a whole bunch of stuff that you're allowed to plug in. So rather than ask that question, another thing that we can say is what are we not allowed to plug in? 
Alright, so in here, I'm going to start with, well, what can I not have here? This is a fraction. Overall, this function is a fraction. So because it is a fraction, I'm going to say that the domain is, well, the denominator cannot be equal to zero. That's the domain. Well, what does that do for us? Well, let's think about this. I have x squared minus 4. That's a difference of squares. That's x plus 2 times x minus 2. Therefore, x cannot be negative 2. And x cannot be 2. And there we go. That's our domain. x cannot be 2. x cannot be negative 2. We could write this in interval notation, right? That would say from negative infinity up until negative 2, union negative 2 to 2, union 2 to infinity, right? If, um, if you're wondering how I came up with that, well, think about this. If x cannot be equal to negative 2 or 2, well, my number line, here's negative 2, here's 2, x is everywhere that I'm shading now. And we're going from negative infinity to negative 2, not including negative 2, so on and so forth. Right? We can also write this in set builder notation. The set builder notation would say that the domain is the set of all real numbers x such that x is not equal to negative 2 and x is not equal to positive 2. All right? I'm not going to be picky about how to write the domain. If you are okay with, well, I am okay with this very first line here. So if you're okay with that, that's fine. If you want to do the interval notation or the set builder notation, that's fine as well. But as far as I'm concerned, this version is good enough. All right. So let's do another, another example. So that was F. G. Let's say that my function was the square root of x minus 2. All right, so the square root of x minus 2. So now in here, I'm going to say, well, again, we're looking for the domain. So what does that really mean? That means think about all the, pro all the possible numbers that you're allowed to plug in. And it turns out there's a lot of numbers that we're allowed to plug in. So again, we're going to think about, well, what am I not allowed to plug in? And in general, the overall thing here is it's a square root function, all right? So the idea here is that, well, with square roots, well, the inside must be at least zero. It must be greater than or equal to zero, all right? So in here, we're going to say, well, how, how do we do this? Well, we're going to say add the two, done. So the domain is x has to be greater than or equal to two. If you think about the number line, that's saying, well, here's 2. We're allowed to include 2, and we're including everything that's bigger than it. In interval notation, this would be starting at 2, including 2, going all the way up to infinity. In set builder notation, this would be the domain is the set of all real numbers x such that x is greater than or equal to 2. All right. We'll do one more. So that was G. H. And here let's say that f of x is equal to 1 over the square root of, let's do 3x squared minus, uh, that's a good number, 15. All right. Eh, let's do a 17. There we go. Now we're working. Good. So now, in here, well, what do I notice? I see that we've got a fraction, but we've also got a square root. So my domain is going to be, well, we've got a fraction. The denominator cannot be equal to 0. We've got a square root. That tells me that the inside, 3x squared minus 17, must be at least 0. All right, so it cannot be 0, and it must be at least 0, greater than or equal to 0. It cannot be 0, and it's greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so I mean, this first one over here on the left, if I square both sides, I still get 3x squared minus 17 is not equal to 0. So combining these two statements, 
what I really have here is that 3x squared, maybe I'll do them separately, or I'll do it differently. And here, so combining these two, we end up with 3x squared minus 17 must be strictly greater than 0. And the way that we're going to work this out is, well, this is a linear, this, means this is a nonlinear inequality. So the way that we work with nonlinear inequalities, first we figure out what happens in the case where it is equal to 0, all right? And then what we're going to say is, well, that gives us 3x squared is equal to 17, x squared is equal to 17 over 3, which gives me that x must be equal to plus or minus the square root of 17 over 3. All right. Now, as far as do we care about what that is or not? Not really. We don't really care about the specific value of it. All right. We can always, if we really wanted to, to figure it out, we could plug it into the calculator. All right. I mean, 17 thirds, that's almost 6, 5, five and change. So the square root of that, um, 2 and change, less than 3, doesn't really matter. What really what matters here is what do we do with that information? So we have our number line. Here is negative radical 17 thirds, and here is positive radical 17 thirds. Right? Both of them are inside the square root. All right. Now we know from the very beginning that we weren't allowed to equal zero. So we're not allowed to equal these values, so we're not allowed to include them. So I put open circles around them. And now what I need to do is I need to test values around these. So into my inequality to figure out where the inequality is true. In general, the easiest values to test are 0, 1, and negative 1 in that order where 0 is the easiest. So in here I can test 0. Now 1 and negative 1, I can't really use those. So I'm going to use 3 and negative 3 and figure out what happens. So let's see, when I plug in 0, 0 squared is 0 times 3 is 0 minus 17 is negative 17. Is negative 17 greater than or equal to 0? No, so false. Plug in negative 3, negative 3 squared, that's 9 times 3 is 27 minus 17 is 10. Is that greater than 0? Yes. Similarly, plug in 3, 3 squared, 9 times 3, 27, blah, blah, blah. Same exact values, so we get true there. So we shade the parts where, where it was true, and now we can confidently say that our domain is from negative infinity to negative radical 17 thirds, union radical 17 thirds to infinity. All right? And if you really wanted to rationalize this, I mean, this is radical 3 times 17, so that's 51. So we have radical 51 over 3. Um, but anyway, so that's finding the domain of some simple functions. All right, now let's look at some, some things that might or might not be a function. All right, so let's talk about the vertical line test, which I, I alluded to earlier. But uh, let's actually work with it. So the graph of an equation, the graph of the graph of a function. Sorry, graphs of functions. And in here, first we're going to start with defining the vertical line test. And this is what the vertical line test says. A graph in a coordinate plane is the graph of a function if and only if
no vertical line. Intersects the graph at more than one point. Right, a graph in a corner plane is a graph of a function if and only if no vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. So, for example. If I have this, this is not a function. Because if I were to draw a vertical line, I intersect it. It's possible to, to draw uh, a vertical line and intersect the graph at more than one point. Uh, however, something like this would be a function. All right. Perhaps I'll color that. Oh, I guess I can't. Um, that's fine. I'll just redraw it. All right. So that right there, that one would be a function because you cannot draw a vertical line and hit it more than once. All right. Um, we can also... Look at this scenario. Oh, let's draw in white. If I have something like this, this is also a function. And now this is a function because again, there's no there's no vertical line that I can draw that would make this that will make the line hit the graph twice. Even if I look at this part right here, if I look at this dotted yellow line, if I were to draw that line, it hits it at one spot but not at the other because it's open, right? So we have to be careful about scenarios like that. If this had been closed, then this would not be a function. But because it isn't, it is definitely a function, all right? So now, Let's uh, talk about some functions that you should know from the top of your head, what they generally look like, all right? So graphs you should recognize. So simple ones would be things like this. That's y equals x. Well, we're talking about functions, so let's talk about f of x equals x, right? In general, linear functions, that's what they look like. Uh, perhaps I'll yeah. Let's let's change that color. Where is it? There we go. We also have y equals x squared, or f of x equals x squared. That is a parabola facing upwards, where the vertex is the origin. We've got things like f of x equals x cubed, where it looks as follows. All right. Um, We've got things like the square root of x. All right, so that is f of x equals the square root of x. Some other ones. This is the absolute value function, all right? So that's the absolute value of x, which can be written as a piecewise function, as x, where x is greater than or equal to 0, or negative x, where x is less than 0. All right? 
we also you should also recognize um, f of x is equal to one over x. All right, one over x has two asymptotes, one vertical and one horizontal. All right, and that's what that looks like. Um, we sh <clears throat> you should recognize f of x is equal to 1 over x squared, where it looks kind of similar to the one that we just did. Um, but it's more like a volcano. All right, it still has the two, the two asymptotes, a vertical one and a horizontal one, but now it's facing differently. A couple of other ones. You should also know what f of x equals sine of x looks like, which we already spoke about. All right, that's sine of x. You should also know what cosine of x looks like. Essentially that, right? Um, now those are all functions that you should know on top of your head. So now, let's look at some transformations. All right. So transformations. So, given y is equal to f of x. So, these are transformations given that y is equal to f of x. We've got vertical shifts. All right. And a vertical shift means it's something like y equals f of x plus k. All right. Where k is just some real number value. So if I have, so let's, let's look at this. If this is, for example, f of x is equal to, this means y is equal to f of x. So this is just a generic function, y is equal to f of x. And let's say we had something like this. Um, let's work with just a parabola. There we go. If I want to look at y equals f of x plus k, all right? Where here k is greater than zero. If k were greater than zero and I'm doing y equals f of x plus k, what that's going to do is it's going to shift everything up by k units. All right. So in here, this that little distance there is a distance of k units. Similarly, if I looked at y equals f of x plus k, where k is less than zero. So essentially what we're doing there is f of x minus k, all right? But I'm gonna write it as plus k, where k is less than zero. That would be a shift downwards. So it would be something like this, all right? And in there, this distance here is k, all right? So everything shifted down by k units. <clears throat> so that's the vertical shifts. The horizontal shifts. So the horizontal shift is when we have things like f of x minus h. Right? All right so in here, this is going to be a shift. A horizontal shift by h units. So let's look at a similar scenario again. So we're going to look at y equals just f of x. And again, I will start with my parabola. If I have y equals f of x minus h, where h is greater than zero, all right? So this is going to be a shift to the right. All right, so if I have 
my h being positive. So for, ex so, so for example, x minus 3. h is 3, 3 is positive, all right? So the opposite sign there. So everything here would move over by h units to the right. Similarly, I can say y equals f of x minus h, where h is less than 0. So essentially, because h is less than 0, it would be something like negative 3. So I could have something like x minus negative 3, so x plus 3. So I would be shifting to the left by 3 units. Right, and in there, that shift is also h units. All right. We also have things like reflections, all right, and really there's, so let's look at, let's say that this was my function, well, let me draw it. So there's two types of reflections, a vertical reflection and a horizontal one, but let me just draw a line here. Well, let's make this super visible as to what's, what it's doing. All right, so let's say that that's my function, right? And I want to talk about reflections. So this would be y equals negative f of x. When I have y equals negative f of x, it's a reflection about the y-axis. So reflection about y-axis. Sorry, about the x-axis. I was saying it wrong. Reflection about x-axis. So that means that everything just gets flipped. All right. So what do we end up with? Well, something like this. Right. That's just a reflection about the x-axis. We cannot do reflections about the y-axis when we're doing functions because then me about the x-axis um, in the sense of finding a function but we could reflect them I think I phrased that weird ignore my phrasing so this is going to be about the x-axis about the y-axis sorry so this is a reflection about the y-axis I think what I meant to say earlier was we cannot have symmetry about the x-axis. But anyway, back to this y-axis stuff, reflection. So if I were to reflect the original function about the y-axis, it would be something like this. Right? That would be my reflection about the y-axis. Let's make that curve more pronounced. There we go. That looks way more curvy. Cool. So now, that will be reflection about the x-axis and the y-axis. We can also reflect about the origin. All right. And this is what it will look like. Reflection about the origin, just like when we were talking about symmetry, is just really rotational reflection. So here this would be y equals negative f of negative x. And what that would look like is the following. Oh, look at that. I messed up. Did I? No, I didn't. I'm good. Look at that. I thought I messed up, but I didn't. Good job, me. So in here, when we're doing re um, reflection about the origin, what we're going to do is we're going to have a rotational symmetry. So we have something like this. All right. And there we go. There you have it. Notice that the rotation about the origin is essentially rotating, um, it's, it's me, the reflection about the, the origin or rotation about the origin is the same thing as reflecting about the x and y axis. So this is about origin. All right. So that's just some transformations in general and how to find them or how, how to apply them. Um, real quick, I want to talk about well, let's talk about the leading coefficient test because that is a super helpful one. All right. So
so the leading coefficient test. I think that's how you spell coefficient. It looks correct. I don't know. So given a polynomial, given f of x is a polynomial function, So something like a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 all the way down to a sub 2 x squared, a sub 1 x, and a naught. Right? So in there, a sub n is the leading coefficient. Right? A naught is the constant term now what we really care about here with this leading coefficient test is the degree as well as the leading coefficient so let's talk about the degree n is the degree so the degree is the exponent of the leading co of the variable in the leading coefficient so now this is what the leading coefficient test says well, let's think about the possibilities for the leading coefficient. We have two options. Either our leading coefficient is positive or our leading coefficient is negative. For the degree, the degree is the exponent of our polynomial. And since we're working for a polynomial with a polynomial, that means our degree must be our, our exponent must be a whole number. So, because it's a whole number, there's only two possibilities. And it's either even. That's just even. N is even. Or N is odd. All right? Now, the lean coefficient test essentially tells us the behavior of our functions, of our polynomial functions. And what it does is, well, if N is even, so even degree, and we have a positive leading coefficient, that's going to tell us that we're going to start in quadrant 2 and end in quadrant 1. What happens in the middle doesn't matter too much, so it could look something like that. That would be a polynomial of even degree with a positive leading coefficient. If I have a negative leading coefficient, that tells me I start in quadrant 3 and end in quadrant Four. And again, what's in the middle isn't too important. When I have an odd degree and a positive leading coefficient, I start in quadrant 3 and end in quadrant 1. So it would be something like that. That would be a good one. But if I have a negative leading coefficient, I start in quadrant 2 and end in quadrant Four. And again, for the purposes of this, doesn't matter too much what it looks like. Again, it just tells us the end behavior of these things. All right. What's going on as you go to negative infinity and positive infinity on the x values? All right. That was the leading coefficient test. Next thing I want to talk about here is composite functions. All right. So composite functions. So given functions f and g, the notation f composed with g of x is the same thing as saying f of g of x. All right? So that, that notation, f composed with g of x, that is the composite of f with g. All right? The domain of 
f composed with g is the set of all x in the domain of g such that g of x is in the domain of f. All right. So let's get a visual as to what I just said there. All right. Let's say that here we have the domain of g. This is my domain of g. And here I have my point x. What we're going to do here is we're going to go to some other set all the way out here. But before we do that, we're going to stop at this other set. This other set down here in the middle, that's the domain of f. All right. And here is where g of x exists. All the way over here, and this set all the way out here to the right, that's going to be f composed with g of x. All right. So in there, that's essentially what we get. And we have that we're going to go from the domain of g into the domain of f. That's going to be via the function g. And then we're going to go from there to f of g of x via the function f. Overall, what's really happening here is we're going from one set to the other up there via the function f composed with g. All right. So that's in general what's going on with those. So let's talk about how to apply this. So let's say let there we go nice let me scroll let f of x be equal to um, 2x minus 3 and then g of x be equal to cosine of x all right so first we're going to find, so find, I think we're at g, find f composed with g of x. Well, f composed with g of x really says f of g of x. And what does that really tell me? That tells me that plug in g of x wherever I see x in f. So I have 2 times g of x minus 3. But I know what g of x is. g of x is cosine of x. So I have 2 times cosine of x minus 3. Cool. Now let's do g composed with f of x. If I have g composed with f of x, what that's really saying is g of f of x, which really means plugging f into g. So I have cosine of f of x, right? All I'm doing there is plugging in f into g. But what's f? f was 2x minus 3, so I have cosine of 2x minus 3. Done. If I have um, f composed with f of x, what well, I'm saying f of f of x, which really say 2 times f of x minus 3, which would really be 2 times 2x minus 3 minus 3, which would then be 4x minus 6 minus 3, so 4x minus 9. All right, that would be f composed with f. Now, uh, let me change the color for a little bit. That's blue. Now, I want to make a one last example here. So, example j. 
just to be clear about that. So in here, I compose f with g and g of f and g with f. So actually, I didn't want to make another example. What I might, what I want to do is I want to make a note. There we go. So in here, note f composed with g is not g composed with f. Right. In general, f composed with g is not g composed with f. Very rarely is that true in terms of functions overall. Um, there are very important scenarios where it is true, and that's in the case of inverse functions. But we'll talk about that later. Um, so now, I'm not going to go over it. The next thing I want to say here is test for even and odd functions. So test for even and odd functions. Remember, even functions were symmetric about the y-axis, and odd functions were symmetric about the origin. So the test for even functions is if I have if I plug in negative x, I'm supposed to get uh, just f of x. The test for odd functions is if I plug in negative x, I'm supposed to end up with negative f of x, right? So that's essentially what the test is. That's the definition and the test. An even function is one where it's one. Ah, duh. Sorry, an even function is one where f of negative x equals f of x, and an odd function is one where f of negative x equals negative f of x, all right? So let's determine if the function is odd, even, or neither. Right. So, example J. F of x is equal to um, x cubed minus x. All right. So we're going to determine if it's odd, even, or neither. And let's look at the definitions. Notice that in both definitions, they start out with the same thing: f of negative x. What's really different is what's on the other side. So that's really telling us, well, plug in negative x, see what you get. So let's see what happens. So I have f of negative x. That's going to be negative x cubed minus negative x. Getting rid of parentheses here, well, the negative x to the third power, a negative to, a th to an odd power is still negative. So I have x cubed minus negative means plus. The next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to factor out a negative sign giving me the negative of x cubed minus x. Look at that. In parentheses, that's my function. So I get negative f of x. So what I found here is that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x, which implies odd. It was an odd function. All right. So now, that was j. OK. Let's say that I had something like f of x is equal to x to the fifth plus x squared, right? And again, I'm going to start the same exact way. I'm going to say, well, f of negative x would be negative x to the fifth plus negative x quantity squared. If I get rid of parentheses, I end up with negative x to the fifth plus x squared. And... From there, if I factor out a negative sign, I would end up with the negative of x to the fifth minus x squared. Look at that. That's nothing, right? The that, that thing in parentheses there, that's not what I had up here. So this is not, so it's definitely not odd. Excuse me. Um, it's definitely not even. So it's not what I had there. It's not what uh, the negative of it. 
So this is neither, neither even nor odd. <coughs> Let's say that I had something like f of x is equal to negative x to the fourth plus x squared. All right. Let's, let's add something to this. Plus 2. So in here, <clears throat> again, I start with plugging in negative x and see what I get. And... I have a negative x to a power to an even power, so it's going to be positive. But with a negative on the outside, it stays negative. Similarly, here it stays. <coughs> so <coughs> you'll notice here that my final answer is exactly the function f of x. So what we have here is that f of negative x is equal to f of x, which implies even. All right. <clears throat> now, you may have noticed something here. When it comes to polynomials, you can essentially just look at the powers. All right. When it comes to the polynomials, you can essentially look at the powers. What do I mean? Look at example J. We had that it was an odd function. If you look at the exponents there, all the exponents that show up are odd. Every exponent is odd. We have an exponent of 3 and an exponent of 1. It's an invisible one, but it's still there. So because all the exponents were odd, the function was odd. In k, well, let's skip k for a second. L, all the exponents are even. 4 is 0, 2 is 0. I mean, 4 is even, 2 is even, and over here there's an invisible x to the 0. And 0 is even. So in there... Every exponent that showed up was even, so the function was even. In k, we had both odd and even exponents. 5 is odd, 2 is even. So overall, that function was neither even nor odd. That trick that I just explained only works for polynomials. It doesn't work with any other kind of function. All right, so if I had a rational function or a trigonometric or logarithmic or exponential, that trick would not work, all right? Um, or or maybe a radical function either. So for example, let's, let's look at one. Uh, that's L. So let's say that I had f of x is equal to x cubed times the square root of x squared plus 1, all right? And that's an x cubed. Let's make that x cubed more visible as an x cubed. There we go, x cubed times the square root of x squared plus one. And we're gonna apply the same exact idea to check if it's even or odd, plug in negative x. So I have negative x cubed times the square root of negative x squared plus one. A negative to an odd power is negative. x cubed is x cubed. A negative to an even power is positive, and then I end up with x squared plus one. Notice here that there's the same thing as saying the negative of x cubed times the square root of x squared plus 1. And that, as written, that is the original function. So I have the negative of f of x. And what you note there is that f of negative x is negative f of x, which implies this is an odd function. All right. Now... <clears throat> Let's look at this. In here, I had both odd and even exponents showing up, but this was not a polynomial function. All right, with non-polynomial functions, you cannot just look at the exponent. All right, that is the end of one point three. Wasn't that fun? If you think I made a mistake somewhere, you're probably right. Tell me all about it in the comments. If you feel you learned something from me in this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, but more importantly, share it. Share this video with your classmates. And remember, you don't have to like math in order to be good at it. But you do have to be good at it.
I am Jose Orozco. Goodbye.